here. Welcome everybody to the 95th monthly meeting of the Strong and Sustainable Business Model Group. Once again, we're fully virtual and we get to see each other's faces through these tiny little lenses. So um, I'm just going to mute everybody so that uh, you'll be able to unmute yourself. But just so when the video, if people make noises, they don't pop up on the screen. So it made a little, little, little bit less editing for me in the uh, after the fact. So for the topic today, members, uh, oh, Stephen's not going to be here. So Tim Posalt uh, of Desolate Research and Ronnie Saad from Refocus, they're going to share the details of their efforts to tailor the enterprise evolution approach and program for the municipal sector. Designed in 2018 to enable businesses in the offshore drilling sector in Norway to improve their strategy development capability, the program was advanced and customized to support an exciting engagement between Refocus and Kitchener, Canada's fastest growing city. But before we get started, let's consider our privilege. In Canada, it's customary for us to start events such as this with an acknowledgement that compared to Indigenous populations, we are all newcomers here, whether our families have lived here for months or for a century. This is part of our truth and reconciliation process with our First Nations and the Indigenous peoples of Canada. We ask that you take a moment to reflect on research and understand your own local context about the lands where you live, work, and play. In this spirit, we acknowledge for all of us, this is sacred land on which each of us is privileged to be. This land, nearby lakes and sea, has supported human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge, and tradition. We are privileged to be beneficiaries and the stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the seven generations to come and beyond. We invite you to consider your relationship to land and how you benefit from being here while the original caretakers may not. Take a moment to reflect on, research, understand, honor, and respect peoples indigenous to the lands where you live, work, and play. Today, each place around the world is increasingly home to peoples from across the world, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to be here where we are today. Do you know which watershed you're in? Put that in the chat if you know where you are. In 2013, Calgary and region became a bit more intimate with its watershed. I'm in the Bow River Basin. First Nations people have used the Bow River and its, and its wetlands and riparian regions for more than 10,000 years. The rivers and its tributaries not only supported local plant and wildlife, to provide a natural strategic base and transportation route forcing human populations to remain within reasonable distances to water. Normally, I'd be connecting from downtown Calgary, our co-working space, which is nine or 10 blocks from the river. We sit on the east edge of the Beltline and the west edge of Victoria Park and the south edge of downtown, the Downtown Association, a connecting point between three communities. Today, my place is home. I'm in the southwest community of Ross Carrick, which is 10 or, 10, 10 or 12 long blocks from the Bow River and west of downtown. One of the reasons we make this biophysical recognition is because it's connected to the place that we're in and it's dependent on the places that we're all in. Just think about where the sewer in your building is connected to. I'm sure you visited the bathroom just before this meeting or maybe you will afterwards. And you're dependent on the ecosystem service that is provided by the watershed that you're in. For those of you who are exploring better business models, the tool called the Flourishing Business Canvas enables you to explore how an enterprise interrelates and is interdependent with the social and biophysical context. Nature is the foundation of our social and economic prosperity. We are a tribe as of today of 2,024 people around the world. We're a community of innovation, practice and research and our focus is on the design of enterprises that are what we call fit for the future. We consider enterprises fit for the future if they follow and accomplish a normative purpose which we call flourishing. For that, we offer a global network of possibilities for your education, research, and employment. It's a network that you can enter quite quickly. People are very open for collaboration, for cooperation. There's a lot of knowledge and a lot of competencies and skills in this group and many fun people to interact with. We have several streams of interest. And I'll invite you to take a look at our wiki page where you'll find out much more about this group. All right, so you can find our wiki page here. And you can also find our Google Drive where all of our past presentations and recording, recordings live. And I've also added our social media here. So we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook under, under the Strongly Sustainable Business Models and LinkedIn, we're called the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. 
So hopefully you're in the right place and ready to engage in a global network of possibilities, the flourishing enterprise movement. We would like to think that we're contributing to a growing and worldwide movement for flourishing enterprises. And the goal here is to create impact at scale quickly to create a world where enterprises excel because humans flourish and nature thrives. So all of this is based on the transdisciplinary science systems, based science, indigenous knowledge, ethical and moral frameworks. And through this, we consider ourselves to be not only in sync with the UN sustainable development goals, but even going beyond the sustainable development goals. I'm going to do another quick poll, ending the poll, sharing the results, a lot of entrepreneurs. So 75% entrepreneurs, 25% investors, zero foundations, except for me, but I can't vote. 50% uh, business people, 38% scholars, 38% service providers or intermediaries, 38% researchers, 25% not-for-profit and 38% other. Some of the logos, which you see here, uh, which we sort of consider ourselves a part of this movement, um, and you might recognize some of them and some of them you might not, but we invite you to look them up and uh, find out what's uh, interesting about them and how you might be interested in them and how they connect to what we're doing. They're very valuable contributing members of our collaborative. So these are the, some of the initiatives that members of our group have formed in, in, in order to do good to do well. So what this means is that members here in this group can come together and, and create initiatives at any time to drive their desired impact. And it's really up to you to find a way to do good, to do well, and to motivate other members to join you in your quest to do so. I invite you to look at these um, groups here, and you can also find these in the wiki if you want to find out more. And last but not least, we're also a collaboration hub for <clears throat> Strongly Sustainable in the sense of scientific publications, book publications, conferences, and uh, international conferences, uh, which you'll be hear hearing about here and uh, off and on. Now, I think I updated these slides, but I didn't have links to some of them, so I wasn't sure. So if there's anybody who is knowledgeable about these conferences or things that are coming up in the, ne in the near or far future, uh, just let Tim and I know so that we can make sure that this slide stays updated. <coughs> Members use this group to start and share their work. They help to build and strengthen research and practice connections to our mutual benefit. Some recent examples of where, uh, oh yeah. and now before the main attraction, one, la one last introduction is Tim and I. We are, are the community animators. We volunteer our time to try to make these meetings interesting and to try and create some strategy and engagement around um, bringing the community together, the collaborative, the people that are um, you know, wanting to be a part of what this is. How do, we, how do we find out where people need to plug in? How do we figure out what people are up to? <coughs> I had a poll there, but I didn't enable it, so I don't know what it is. So I'm going to start off with uh, introducing Randy, and I think Randy, you're going first. So Randy, Sa uh, Randy Saad is the executive director of Refocus, a groundbreaking not-for-profit cooperative. With Refocus, Randy collaboratively de developed the proprietary enterprise evolution approach and applied learning program, which enables senior leaders to leverage the lens of sustainability to develop improved strategy and evolve management practices in response to accelerating global change. Randy, you want to take it away? Sounds great. Thanks for the introduction, Laurie. Can everybody hear me okay? It's a bit faint. <coughs> Is it any better now? Just yeah. wonder if maybe my mic Perfect. was tucked behind my collar. Perfect. Um, I think I know almost everyone on the call. Uh, and uh, I think for the most part, Tim and I wanted to make the conversation pretty personal. Tim, did you want to set the stage? In terms oh, of thanks, Randy. Yeah. Go for it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, as Randy said, I think we all uh, know, know each other, have met each other in these meetings before. So uh, that actually fits perfectly the, the intention um, and the plan that Randy and I had for this meeting, because uh, um, we also heard what happened last month and that you guys really enjoyed that session very much. Um, and so, so we were also thinking to not make it a, a one of those um, just classic kind of have an hour long presentation sessions. But I mean, uh, we're a community. I think we're all more or less working towards the same goal, um, and and I think what we are presenting today is uh, is essentially a use case of how how what we're developing together can be applied um, in a practical setting, 
And so we want to introduce that to you guys, um, but we also really want to encourage um, active discussion, questions, ideas. We want to hear your thoughts. We want you to challenge what we did. Um, and, and so please feel free to at any time um, ask questions or chime in with any ideas. Um, ideally, maybe uh, put them in the chat and, and Laurie, um, whenever you feel like it's the appropriate moment, you can just interrupt us and, and just um, kind of so we can address these questions openly. We don't want to make it a um, that we stop and then say, are there any questions or comments, but we can very much keep it in a fluid um, way. Um, so what we're also, what our intention is through that is that we don't just want to present to you what we have done over the last couple of months and, and get your feedback on that, but very much also um, kind of being mindful of what we're trying to achieve as a community, which is essentially developing um, the tools that are needed for, for strongly sustainable solutions in, in practice and, uh, and also very much finding ways to apply those tools to put them into practice and learning from and with each other how we can do that. And so that's the approach we'd like to take. We're, we're, we're going to handle it a bit more as a dialogue. We're going to show some slides in between, but um, let's keep this an, an easy um, meeting among peers, I would say. Yeah, yeah perfectly said, Tim. Thanks for that. Um, so the, the topic of conversation today is the enterprise evolution innovation that we've been developing over the last several years. And by we, I mean several of us, not limited to Tim, myself, and Stephen either. Um, so we'll provide a little bit of background and, and talk a bunch about sort of what's evolved more recently. Um, part of it has been through engagement within this community uh, practice, and uh, it's led us down this path of, of testing the innovation and evolving it for the municipal sector. So we'll talk a little bit about the experience that we've had and some of the, the forward-looking opportunity that we see emerging. Um, so without further ado, let me um, quickly share my screen. Okay, so I, I mean, as Tim mentioned, we wanna keep this pretty conversational and it's, it's about us interacting as a community practice. So this is really about the value it contributes that we were able to contribute through our dialogue. So we've stitched together a few slides here and there to support what we're saying, just so that there's a, a visual anchor, but for the most part, we're, we'll be talking a little more casually. Um, so I, I thought I'd begin by just, um, starting with the beginning, which is how the Enterprise Evolution innovation came to be. Um, so it all began back in 2017, I believe, when Anthony Upward, who I imagine all of you know and know well, um, was approached by an innovation cluster in Norway called GC Noda. That's the Global Centers of Ex Expertise, Norwegian Offshore Drilling and Engineering. It's one of the leading um, innovation clusters in Europe. and on behalf of a, a community of about 200 businesses that provide products and services to the state-run offshore drilling organization. Um, GC Noda provides programming, professional development, conferences, et cetera, networking opportunities to about 100 of the organizations within that community. So um, for Noda, their challenge was just kind of observing reality um, as an organization they were looking at the, the, the circumstances, the conditions that were emerging. I mean, most obviously the price of oil had been falling off a cliff for a while. Uh, the, the, the actual Norwegian government had been divesting from fossil fuels and there was you know, a lot of writing on the wall globally that would suggest their, their companies, their industry was in trouble. And so their thought was, you know, how do we prepare an industry of organizations to begin to transition over the next five to 10 years, let's say perhaps longer, but in any case, to begin the process of, of engaging with the reality of the situation and beginning to prepare for the kind of dramatic change that may be necessary. And so um, they did a bit of a global search, found Anthony and the Flourishing Business Canvas. Um, as some of you may know, you know business modeling is, is much more in, in fashion in, in Europe, where uh, um, trends tend to be a little bit further ahead than they are here in North America. And so they were really interested in what the canvas could do. Um, Anthony had just finished um, completing, along with Stephen Davies, the Flourishing Enterprise Strategy Design Method, who I imagine most of you are, are aware of, um, which combines uh, the process of backcasting with the use of the Flourishing Business Canvas in order to build better strategy. And so that became the, the foundation of the program that Anthony was solicited to develop in partnership with GC Noda to help the organizations that are part of that community. Um, I ended up being pulled into <clears throat> the project by Anthony based on my background in trans transformational or transformation program design as a management consultant and based on the work that I do with Refocus. 
which is really about sustainability as a lens for transformation. And quickly the program evolved to something more holistic and complete. And it was out of the experience we had working with GC Noda that we created Enterprise Evolution. And Enterprise Evolution in a nutshell was really about recasting how we understand organizational management based on a, a, a system or a systemic view of the world. So essentially leveraging the lens of sustainability to, to look at all that's involved in the organization. And within that umbrella, um, really there was an opportunity to begin to leverage many of the innovations that exist within this community and beyond. Um, so innovations that have to do with business modeling and strategy, but also performance management, uh, leadership competencies, so on, et cetera. Um, I noticed there was some questions or comments that came up. Was there a, a good, was this a good point to pause? Maybe address something that's come that's up? Me, that's just me saying, I love your logo. It's very beautiful. Yeah, oh, thank you. Very good. Um, and so, um, in terms of uh, saying a little bit more about enterprise evolution, before I go back to what happened in Norway, um, just to orient you, it, it, there's a lot to unpack, but the idea is the program simply recognizes that um, there is disruption, disruptive change that's accelerating globally and that to remain viable, organizations really need to fluidly evolve and, in, and engage more consistently in transformational change. And so, the program is really designed to support leadership teams rethinking their perspective on organizational management with this emerging reality in mind. Um, so there's a bunch of characteristics that are key to the program. Um, first of all, um, the approach relies on, on adopting a systemic understanding of the organization and its relationship to the larger economic, social, and environmental systems within which it exists. So leaders in, who apply this evolve their organization by, by essentially following an advanced and iterative approach to strategy development and implementation that's continuously improved over time. And ultimately to execute the approach, it's recognized that leaders need to develop new competencies and the organization itself needs to build new capabilities. And so um, we, we essentially stitch together um, in a way that would be tailored to the audience, uh, a variety of innovative management tools and, and methods um, that would essentially address the organization's needs and meet them where they are. Um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll pause there in terms of what enterprise evolution represents and maybe finish quickly with a little bit of a reflection on what happened in, in Norway. Um, so simply, um, the program we launched was a pilot with three organizations working in a peer group. Um, and uh, it was quite successful. Our experience was typically as we engaged organizations in talking about their current approach to strategy and then took them through the process of beginning to examine all of the things in the world that were changing that are and will soon or may affect their organization in the future, they all came to their holy crap moment quite reliably where they realized all that they were doing was not only inadequate for engaging with the complexity that was emerging, but it was actually somewhat irresponsible as much as it may have been effective for the decades they had applied their, their knowledge and, and skills previously. So they were very motivated to participate in something different and new and uh, the program was successful. It was scaled up to three cohorts. And interestingly, this innovation cluster saw the opportunity to begin um, deploying the innovation or the program they had developed, which included a learning management system and a, and a train the trainer model to innovation clusters in other sectors. So this has become leading edge in Norway and is now being used in other sectors, which is fantastic um, and something we're very excited about. And it's even better that, you know, our model of enabling others to lead this change has resulted in, in a, an opportunity to scale that we couldn't have possibly managed ourselves. So um, it was at the beginning of 2020 for myself as the executive director of Refocus and having engaged with many people in this community, especially those who are um, close to the, the Toronto um, maybe portion of, of the SSBMG community um, that I recognized that there was a lot of people doing a lot of different things that were really great. And um, there was a lot of validation in terms of the utility and, and, um, and potential for some of the, the solutions and innovations that we've been deploying. But no one had really developed a consultancy or a practice that was scaling um, the mobilization of these solutions in industry. Um, and so I reached out to a number of different individuals, some of them on this call, um, and basically said, who's interested in collaborating? Who wants to run a market test where we could sort of think about the way that all of our innovations fit together and what we're each up to and, and come up with a means for, 
for perhaps promoting this and determining if there is an opportunity to scale what we do by marketing it effectively. And it was through that conversation that I ended up engaging with Tim and the timing just happened to be right. Some people um, got deeply involved and, and pulled back out for various reasons and so forth. But essentially that was the beginning of our market test and it ended up being that Tim, myself and Stephen Davies ended up running ahead with uh, Enterprise Evolution and uh, the, the market test that I've described. Um, I think back over to you, Tim. Yeah, <laughs> essentially, I mean, you 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 described uh, exactly what was my perspective on on how we started as well. Um, I mean, I I came to Toronto. I think it was I think my first meeting was in April two thousand nineteen, and uh, and I was so happy that I found this community, and I was so amazed by by what was going on in the community um, that that I knew I just wanted to engage much more, and and especially around all the innovations that I saw that had been developed and. And the spirit of the community and and so i think pretty soon i started annoying anthony and and uh, i i kept saying man there's so much great stuff there but like we need to pull all of this together and and so as a kind of we, we need not a consultancy but something like it right that that brings these and, and not that that doesn't exist but i felt like there was so much potential from all the knowledge and from from um, all the manpower in this uh in this group that i felt like there's so much potential um and, and so I, I kept asking Anthony, how can we get that uh, off the ground? You know, how can we do that? And then uh, when, when Randy approached me in January, um, that was exactly, um, I mean, he just hit a spot there. He was talking about exactly the same things that, that I felt like um, I had been hoping to see. And uh, it didn't take long to, to motivate me to be a part of it. And of course, given my personal situation, it was also the perfect time um, as a newcomer in Canada for me to really deeply engage with, Andrew, with, with Randy and uh, and get things off the ground. And uh, and so I, I still view things the same way. I think what I've experienced since then has very much been a, a confirmation and, and the developments, I think also globally that have happened since then are very much of a, a confirmation of our research and our work, um, not just us, but the entire community. And I think the demand, um, I mean, just as a brief side note, I'm, I'm now working as a postdoc at the university here and the amount of, of interest and calls and, uh, and new topics around sustainability, also in industry and the interest in how do we address that as an organization. I've, I've never experienced that before here. That wasn't a topic at all. And now it's just blowing up. And so I think the potential for the future is, is incredibly great. Yeah. Brilliant. Um... Yeah, so it, it was amazing the way that things lined up and funny how how things have a way of working out as we began down this path of establishing a brand and, and figuring out how we're going to market ourselves and so forth. Suddenly, an opportunity emerged a little bit unexpectedly. So um, I had, through my original refocus methodology, which is really oriented towards sustainability practitioners and helping them to design transformational programs rather than working with senior leadership teams, which is the focus of Enterprise Evolution, I had engaged with the head of sustainability at Wilford Laurier University, and she went through um, our year-long applied learning program. I got to know her very well, volunteered with her in a number of respects and so forth. And she ended up at the city of Kitchener, not far from my doorstep, just south of Kitchener in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, and she was hired there as the, uh, the corporate sustainability officer. I happened to connect with a city councillor, both of them having talked to me suggested that I, I desperately needed to talk to their head of strategy. And I ended up having a, about a 50 minute meeting with their head of strategy, which was one of the most profound experiences I've had talking about sustainability in my life, uh, at least for that short a period. So I sat down with um, this amazing professional who had been brought in from out West for her strategy expertise, had worked in a variety of industries, was considered a bit of a rock star. And she swooped into to Kitchener and essentially took what was a a bit of a, a disconnected strategy and broader planning process, found ways of stitching it together, building discipline, creating governance, and really took what was functional but not working exceptionally well and made it laser tight and or airtight and laser sharp uh, and won the accolade, accolades of all of uh, the senior leaders in the organization. And so I sat with her, uh, asked her what she had done, you know, was impressed by it, and then essentially spent about 25, 30 minutes explaining our worldview, expressing what's unique about strong sustainability or flourishing versus sort of more conventional ways of understanding sustainability, introduced a couple of examples in the flourishing enterprise strategy design method in the canvas and spoke for about three minutes about what we did in Norway. And at the conclusion of 30 minutes, 
she basically just paused and said, okay, well, um, this is essentially exactly what we need to do. And it's clear that we need to transform our strategy process. And uh, being that this is all systemic in nature, we probably should get the other two cities in this region and the regional government involved because they'll need to follow suit. <laughs> And I just kind of did a triple take, <laughs> was a little stunned by just how quickly she got it. And, you know, Tim can speak to this, but th there was nothing about her interpretation that was superficial or based on a lack of fundamentally getting what we said. She has proven that she's just that, that smart and capable of thinking systemically and appreciating, you know, the whole picture, which was just unbelievable. And I guess... It's funny how timing and just things work out at times when they desperately need to work out. And this was one of those interesting situations where um, working with the opportunity to work with Kitchener set us on a very different and, and ideal path for the conversation Tim and Stephen and I had started. Uh, the question, who is that? This was um, Karen and why is it her name el eluding me all of a sudden? Um, Tim, help me out. Cooper, thank you. Um, yeah, Karen Cooper. Had a manager of strategy, I believe, City of Kitchener. Feel free to look her up. She's ex exceptional. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll pause there and maybe, Tim, you, you can chat a little bit about sort of how we navigated this idea of enterprise evolution, being that we were three solo consultants working together. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a, a lot of, I would say, unusual circumstances uh, coming together. Um, I mean, I, I, let me just uh, quickly maybe chime in on what you said about the City of Kitchener and the individuals we were, we were working with. Um, I think we're also very lucky, I have to say, that uh, that there were some very exceptional individuals on the other side that immediately understood what we wanted to do and that had the same vision for the future. Um, without that, and that helped us a lot along the way as well, I mean, it wouldn't have been possible. Um, and so once I think we realized that that was the situation, I think that, that just... Uh, blew our motivation up times 10 <laughs> and, and we started engaging much, much more deeply and on that specific uh, use case. And so, um, yeah, Randy, to your question, how we engaged, I think uh, what I loved about, about the collaboration was also that it was never about, I mean, all of us had our individual consulting practices from before and, and we all, I think we had one meeting where we addressed this for perhaps 15 minutes and we said, this is not about uh, anyone's consulting practice. This is about doing a market test, whether the innovations of, of this community can really be brought into practice successfully and, and what happens and, and what the effect is um, that we can achieve through those. And so I think after that, we, we just decided to, to center it all around the program and not around one of our practices or all of our practices. They, they actually never really played a role throughout the project. It was all about the program. Yeah. Very good. Um, I will apologize sort of in advance. Um, I, I now officially have my little one in my care. So if I seem a little direct, distracted and I'm looking to my right from time to time, because she's sitting next to me coloring and I'm just making sure she's okay. So apologies if I might have to step away for a moment or two, but- We welcome parentpreneurs. In, indeed, I'm glad to hear. <laughs> it's what you're getting tonight. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, Next, uh, I think what I'd like to engage in really quickly is um, just kind of the distinction between the, what it was like applying enterprise evolution in the Norwegian, um, in the Norwegian context versus what it was like in a municipal context and the challenges that that presented and that that, that, that happened to touch on the question that was asked. I see a whole bunch of smiles. It was that like... <laughs> Well, I, I think the smiles are for me just apologizing that I said manpower because I kind of felt like that was a very antiquated okay. term. And anyways, but there actually is a question by Douglas um, who said, if we can provide an overview of the vision that's driving the regional municipal approach, would you want to say a couple of words to that? Um, yeah, so we were working at the city level with Kitchener. So I'm not actually positive what the regional vision is. And to be frank, uh, I mean, I find municipal visions to be as meaningless as a, a single sentence could be in defining the future of a city of a million people or half a million or a quarter million people. It's, it's ultimately not, it's not the, uh, I don't know that it's, it's super relevant. Most of them are quite aspirational and uh, tend to um, be Id idyllic in many ways, but they don't necessarily translate into everything related. And perhaps you had a different question in mind when you asked vision, you know, perhaps there's something a little more practical um, or 
otherwise, <laughs> sorry for the distraction uh, that you wanted to get at. So Doug, if, if you want to, do you want to elaborate on your question? Is there maybe like, are you just trying to get a sense as to what they're trying to accomplish in engaging with us or as, as a community as a whole? I, what did you have in mind? Yeah, I'm just trying to get uh, some sense of, of what this even means because hmm. um, I know that Kate Rayworth uh, and her um, action lab is now working with three large municipalities and um, and it, it's so it's it seems like it's heading in the same kind of direction that, that Kate is but from an incredibly different point of view mm -hmm. because she's looking at from a macroeconomic perspective and you're coming at it from a, a meso micro um, kind of, of perspective but I'm just not quite sure yep. um, how it touches ground <laughs> really concrete enough yeah, absolutely. And it's it's perhaps a little difficult to explain. I think what I will do shortly is step you through um, a bit of the overarching narrative that we use to engage the, the corporate leadership team at Kitchener, and that might help to clarify things a little. But to, to, to your point, I think largely our objective and what we accomplished was starting with the macro and helping the organization to essentially engage in a mindset shift, grappling with the science-based reality that we know exists, and then translating that into what, what that would mean from a management perspective to do things effectively with respect paid to the systemic nature of, of the world around us. And so it meant in introducing a whole bunch of different innovations. So what I would say is we're doing a lot of what Kate is doing. The difference is we're able to take it the full way through the organization down through the vision to the strategy development to the performance management level, including you know looking at um, the finer aspects of performance managing around um, performance management about around materiality around indicator development and so forth. And I think there's just a much broader and more rich spectrum of innovations that we would introduce within the context of an engagement with a leadership team than what would be represented in, in the donut as, as more of a macro perspective brought down to the level of, of visioning and engagement with stakeholders, et cetera. So, and just to follow up on that, you said um, you were using a, a science-based kind of approach. And I just wonder if that um, meant that it was more um, environmentally focused or did it also um, embrace the, uh, the social dimensions? Definitely both dimensions. So there wasn't a bias one way or the other. The point of, um, I guess, the, the mindset shift was to grapple with the full scope of the reality, you know, based on the natural and social sciences and begin to engage with um, what that meant, what that means from, a, from an organizational and a management standpoint. Well, it sounds great. I'd love to hear more. Yeah. Um, well, so from the perspective of the differences in Norway, things were pretty straightforward. You know, we had business leaders who hadn't really thought or planned based on a broader scope of um, analysis. You know, a lot of the forces of change that we touched on in our conversations weren't already part of their planning practices and processes. Whereas in the case of Kitchener and any, you know, reasonably sized city, um, all of those considerations are very explicitly made. So in, in Norway, it was, it was about, you know, helping leaders come to terms with the fact that their strategy process was narrow and, and to some degree not really enabling them to learn, anticipate, and innovate as they might need to in order to deal with the emerging reality. In the case of Kitchener and cities more broadly, there's a very different scenario in that um, they already have a, an environmental plan, a climate action plan, a sustainability plan, a neighborhood plan, a well-being strategy, you know, so on, et cetera. The, the challenge that they face is, is more that, you know, they, they lack integration. They don't have the governance structure to hold all of these objectives simultaneously and know how to balance them in some sort of way that is rational and um, intended or it, that enables them to come to optimal conclusions about how to allocate resources or set priorities. Um, so the challenges were quite different. They had much to do with silos. They had much to do with the fact that a lot of the ways that they were addressing issues was by taking them one at a time and then adopting a whole bunch of projects that would make progress in a variety of different areas rather than seeing that these issues, challenges, and opportunities are very much interrelated, that they're systemically oriented, that you can't solve one problem without 
um, engaging with many others that surround it. Um, so ultimately the value proposition and how we needed to orient the program was quite different. And that was a challenge. Uh, I think we ended up having about three or four weeks to prepare for this and many months to prepare in Norway. And we ended up realizing as we went along that we had to completely redesign the program, which was a challenge, but it led to a, a pretty significant innovation in what we actually delivered, if, if I could say. Um, Tim, do you wanna speak a little bit to what the program looked like? Yeah, sure, let me do that. I'll just uh, perhaps share my screen for that. I just have to. Um, you know, if I could say it another way while, while you get set up, Tim, you know, one of the things that I think resonated the most or maybe one of the conclusions in an aha moment that many of the senior leaders had was just this idea that they're constantly making trade-offs that they're not aware that they're making. So many of their decisions, whether it be on setting a priority, allocating budget, making a decision, they're, they're ultimately trading off on a whole bunch of different things that they value, but they either don't have the means to value those things, or they don't know how to value it accurately, or their processes just don't lead to them valuing them all at the same time at the point of decision. Sorry, Tim. And perhaps to add to that, I think they're also not making trade-offs that they that uh, they would be making if they were aware that those trade-offs exist, right? And so perhaps also to your to your question and comment, Douglas, um, I think just just one way and one example of how um, the environmental and the social aspects of sustainability were represented in the things that we did. Um, we also provided them with with mindsets or development guidelines um, for for defining developing strategic objectives and actions, which were based on. For example, the Future Fit Business Benchmark with its goals that are both um, societally and uh, uh, environmentally oriented, and so so that was just one way to to kind of um, implement both of both of those sides of sustainability within the work that we did very down to earth um, with with their team. Um, yeah, so to speak a little bit about the Enterprise Evolution Program, how we designed it for the City of Kitchener, um, there are three steps. To this uh, program and uh, on the very left the first step the introductory workshop series that's the step the first step that has already been conducted that we've already gone through um, the other two steps we hope that we'll we'll get to those um, that that we'll be able to to accompany the city of kitchener through those steps as well um, so just to briefly exp explain the introductory workshop uh, series was essentially um, designed to give them a a high level experience of what the entire program could look like, um, the, the mindsets and the worldview it's based on, how that differs from their current worldview and their current practices, um, also taking into account potential for improvement development priorities that they already perceive within their organization, um, taking them to, through an exercise um, to kind of apply and, 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 and give them a sense at least of how practical work with that program would look like. And then lastly, to um, talk about uh, future possibilities of, of how a roadmap for really laying out that program over a longer um, period of time would look like. And so that's, that's the three steps, the, the workshop series that we've gone through already. The next step, um, transformation design. Um, would essentially be a co-creative process um, of really going into uh, the, the context of the city of Kitchener. And I will talk a little bit later about that. Um, let's briefly look at the workshop series. Again, I've, I've just mentioned um, on a high level what we did, but uh, firstly, what, what we were trying to do was we were trying to understand, really understand um, the context that we're dealing with um, for the city of Kitchener and get them also to understand our macro perspectives. So what we did as a first step was we, we handed out to surveys um, that were designed to look at their current strategy development process and also their response to the pandemic, which uh, they had stated before that that was a very different way of doing things that was um, um, received very positively through the organization. And through those surveys, we tried to, um, we tried to surface their development priorities that they already have that are already existing in the organization um, in order to then align them with, with what we were planning to do with them. Um, and, and essentially then we took them um, through uh, also high level kind of mindset based uh, understanding of what a strong sustainability 
the donut, you know, the SDGs, how does all of that fit together? And, uh, and how would all of that act as, as a, a planning framework for them for the future? And because that was um, quite abstract and quite high level, uh, the second workshop focused on a strategy lab where, where we chose um, in collaboration with the city of Kitchener an actual use case, which um, in, in this case was one of their strategic goals, um, which, which aimed at uh, improving the community centers. Um, and so we, we then designed a workshop, um, uh, a workshop tailored on sort of how would you approach the improvement of those community centers through a strongly sustainable lens on a high level. That's what we did with them. And so um, based also on their development priorities, um, we, we designed those exercises focusing on, for example, how to do uh, community engagement better, how to understand um, which stakeholders are relevant, what are the values of those stakeholders, um, how might we measure whether we've actually been able to create value for those stakeholders versus what we're measuring right now, which might, which might not be uh, a good measure for that value at all. So how do you measure the value of 18-year-old uh, kids being able to play basketball um, at, at 9 p.m., for example, in a safe space? Um, et cetera, et cetera. So we took them through through a, a real life challenge, a real life design challenge, and their engagement, I, I think, was exceptional, um, especially seeing as we had to do those workshops uh, online. Um, so we did some neural exercises with them, uh, took them through that challenge. I think, to me, perhaps to say that that was uh, that was perhaps the biggest aha moment for them, where they said, aha, "Now we actually see." Um, how, how you get the rubber on the road, I think is how you say it, right? How, how you put these things into action, right? Um, yes, and so then the, the third workshop after that focused mostly on, um, after they had gotten that experience, to really talk with them about what would it look like if we engaged over a long period of time, if we really went through that transformation program together, um, especially because, um, of course, some of the, the questions arose around how can we integrate that with our current organization, how we're going to be able to put all of that into practice. And um, yeah, so I think, yeah, perhaps briefly, let me walk you through what, what we're hoping are the next steps of what we're, what we're seeing as the next steps to actually design that program for them. Um, just to perhaps also give you a sense of the complexity that's still involved within this project. Um, so, so the next steps for transformation design would include, firstly, uh, even more to deepen their understanding of what tools and methods uh, we could offer to really see which ones would fit for their context, um, to establish through that the program uh, priorities and the focus, and, and then to tailor essentially the scope of what the program would be for them. That's, that's still a smaller step. Um, followed by uh, the potential to, to assess uh, materiality, because a part of our, of our promise was we're, we're not going to let you go in a, a do directional me me measures anymore. So you know you're going somewhere in the right direction, but you don't really know what um, the, the effect of what you're doing really is and if it's the thing that you really should be doing. So we have to assess um, uh, potentially on the level of the bioregion, what are those sustainability factors that measure that matter the most for the city of Kitchener. Um, and through that, uh, define which indicators, which, which goals make sense for the city of Kitchener to be um, addressed through the, the transformation program. And then, and then finally, uh, I mean, some of you uh, might know this as, as parts of uh, the Flourishing Enterprise Strategy Design Method, um, create an inspiring vision for the city of Kitchener. Next year is their um, due date, so to say, for the next 20 year vision. So, so that would fit perfectly. Um, understand where they're at currently and where the gaps are towards to that vision and then jointly develop strategic solutions with that strongly sustainable uh, lens on um, strategic solutions to to get them from their their current state towards um, their vision so so that's that's what we're hoping to do with them in the next step beautiful so uh, just before i um dive into the narrative I promised to share. I just wanted to mention, you know, th there was this realization we had as we got further and further into engaging with the municipality. And it's this recognition that municipalities are so well primed for this work, right? They, they already have all of the wider considerations in mind. They're dealing with all the externalities as their own responsibility. And perhaps from a knowledge mobilization and commercialization perspective, 
the way cities win is they get copied. They don't create competitive advantages. All of their all of their plans and strategies are public domain. So cities that are considered winners, that are attractive to employees, that are places that people want to go are the ones that all the other cities are copying. So their goal when they do something exceptionally advanced or leading edge or different that works really well is to share it. You know, they want to get on the rooftops and scream about it. So when we think about emerging innovations and, and bringing our stuff to market, I mean, I, I'm almost hitting myself in the head going, why weren't we focused on municipalities from the start? But I'll share more about that in, in a bit. I just wanted to share that context. Um, so here, let me share my screen quickly and um, I'll get into the narrative that I promised. So if I could um, explain, I, I would say we probably shared this narrative three times, maybe four times over the course of the three workshops. The idea being that each time we shared it, they had more context to appreciate what the heck we were talking about. And we were able to be a little more bold, a little more concise and to the point and directive. And being that you, all of you have a, a very solid foundation of understanding of the kinds of things we're talking about, I'm gonna be even more brief, but it'll give you a sense as to sort of the, the, the general message that we conveyed. And I'll share with you sort of what happened at a critical interview in the workshop as an anecdote. So we introduced the donut, talk about this kind of representing um, the, the best known natural and, and social science we have, understanding that there are known environmental ceilings that we can accurate, most of which we can accurately measure social foundations the same and that these things are interrelated, interdependent, and uh, need to be respect respected in order for us to be within the green space, the safe and just space for humanity. We present the, the other donut and say, this is our, our actual reality as, as a planet. And um, you know we're dealing with the unintended consequences of the overshoots and shortfalls that we see on either end, blah, 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 so on and so forth. You get the picture, we elaborate, and they get concerned. Um, we introduce this a bit from um, the future fit business benchmark, which speaks to the progression from shareholders to system value. You know, we talked a bunch and did an exercise around where they actually sit and basically explained that without a systemic view of the world, there's no possible way to transition towards actual science-based sustainability. And all we're doing is less harm. Um, so doing more good, feeling better about it, being more aggressive in, or, or more ambitious with our investments, but not actually getting close to the kind of transformation we're looking for, still very much in an incremental stage of progress. Um, we, we brought this up as a mental model, talking about the iceberg. And um, what the iceberg suggests is that the highest leverage points are at the, at the base, the mental models that we use to understand what's happening. Um, and so um, our, our, our sort of suggestion was that most of our work is responding to the events or the patterns of behavior that we see um, unfolding in front of us. And ultimately without in the absence of system structure and, and mental models that are adequately sophisticated for the complexity of what we're responding to, we're essentially not able to respond well enough to make the kind of difference we need. So we need to reconsider our mental models. Um, so we reintroduce the donut and the conversation changes. So at this point, we basically say, you know, the donut is the donut and it's not possible to be a sustainable, a, a, a science based, based on the science, it's not possible to be a, a sustainable organization within an unsustainable system. And, you know, every organization gets to choose how much they want to try to contribute toward the world being in that green space and their organization being near that green space or not. And it really doesn't matter. They get to choose what they get to choose. The thing they don't get to choose though is the worldly conditions that they will face as a result of the overshoots and the shortfalls. And that's, that's the reality quotient here. It's like, it does not matter how much you care about sustainability as an organizational leader, because you are stuck dealing with the rapidly changing conditions that are a function of all of the overshoots and all of the shortfalls. And so not engaging and understanding those and anticipating the implications and the, the very complex and, and systemic implications of these shortfalls and overshoots is just irresponsible and it's going to leave the organization exposed to all kinds of risks and missing all kinds of opportunities that are absolutely relevant to the success and viability of the organization. And so we kind of wrap things with this, this slide here, which 
in which we, we make a pretty bold statement about what our work, our community of practice and our enterprise evolution, innovate, enterprise evolution innovation represents, which is that you, know, you can look to the leading edge in the field of management and you see um, frameworks, tools, ways of understanding that are emerging that point to organizations as a result of the disruptive change we're seeing, needing to be more adaptive, needing to be more agile, needing to enhance their resiliency. But that is all developed in the absence of the underlying mental models that fully depict the reality that exists. And that would be the, the basis of the foundation of natural and social science that allows us to fully understand the reality and not just the events or the patterns of behavior going back to the iceberg that we're trying to be more responsive to. So leading management is gonna get you to be better at reacting. Now, when we look at the sustainability field, most of everything is good work, bud. Good work. Most of everybody is pretty, or, or sorry, most of what's happening in the mainstream is pretty incremental in the nature, in nature. But when we go to the leading edge in the sustainability field, we have stuff like the donut, which is now finally depicting the actual thresholds that we know exist from a scientific perspective and suggesting that we need to find equitable ways of allocating those thresholds across humanity such that everybody has their basic needs met and that we have a fair and just way of living. But the challenge there, just like with the donut, is it's not translated into what an organizational leader needs to know, understand, or do differently in order to, um, in order to respect those boundaries and continue to lead their organization effectively. And so ultimately, what our community of practice and what enterprise evolution represents is the synthesis of the two. It's the recontextualization of leading management knowledge and practice based on the foundational systems-based natural and social science that is necessary to have in the background in order for those management innovations to be truly effective and adequately sophisticated for the complexity we're trying to deal with. And um, I guess to to um, summarize or to close, what I want to share is that, you know, we, we had this reflection, this is halfway through the second workshop. So at this point, we've maybe been in a room with these senior leaders for maybe five hours total. And everybody kind of shared their reflections who came to the CAO and the CAO just paused and literally said, one, this, I get it. Two, this makes perfect sense. And three, this is exactly what we need to be doing for the future. And I'm excited to begin exploring how we can go on that path together. And that was like in the middle of the workshops without having consulted with the rest of his team and so forth. There was no necessity to say that, but it was just that compelling to him and, and based on the reaction of his team that he felt comfortable saying that, which completely blew us away. But it also gave us this feeling that we might actually really be onto something. Anyway, I'll, I'll pause there and back over to you, Tim. Yeah, so bef <clears throat> before we get into this little wind up of the last half hour here, I'd like to just take a pause and take a bit of a family photo with everyone smiling so that we can post out some nice pictures of everyone smiling, maybe a few hand poses, you know, I don't know what what would be fun, what would you be interested in doing, I'm going to pat Tim on the side of the head. <laughs> Um, I just want to people to look away from their screens every once in a while, and um, we're, we're, we our, our faces get kind of kind of droopy when we're watching presentations. So, how can we make our presentations a little bit more fun? All right, back to the questions. Thanks, Laurie. That was awesome. Um, I also want to say, Randy, I'm glad your little ones are joining because now we know how you get your meeting notes. <laughs> 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 handing them to you live as we speak. <laughs> um, great, great call, actually, also, Laurie, because uh, being mindful of the time, we do have a bit more, I mean, we do have a bit more to say about the reaction and the, the outcome and everything, but I, I also want to just be mindful of the fact that we only have 25, 30 minutes remaining, so we can also engage just in an open discussion from now on, and and we'll probably have an opportunity to say what we were going to say anyways during that discussion. Um, what, what do you think is best? 
I think it'd be great to open it up and have a few questions now in case there there are some that have come to mind. We can absolutely pause the discussion and come back uh, and adjust our timing based on how much. That's what I'd say as well. Yeah, right I think on. that's great. <laughs> so let's let's stop it here for the moment. And we're really curious about, about your thoughts, your own experiences, how that relates to what you're doing. Um, yeah, please uh, just go ahead. It makes a ton of sense to me that uh, you've zeroed in on on the municipal um, level because it it is that place that connects um, the bigger world to the to the real communities and the cohesion that either does or doesn't exist across um, those communities. And uh, it's interesting too that you sort of zeroed in on community centers because for a long time I felt like they've. They're, they aren't really centers for the building of community. They are service centers uh, with a certain uh, framework of activities that they do. And, uh, and the whole question of what would it take for them and what would even be their goal of um, really becoming catalytic within the change um, process of mm -hmm. trying to create cultural change um, and that, that would extend the co-creative processes to the community itself and the awareness of, uh, of where we are in um, planetary boundaries and, and, uh, and in the donut and, and um, that sort of thing and begin to collectively re-envision where the community wants to go. And it just feels like, I don't know a place that is, uh, is, is on that path. Uh, maybe Kitchener is, I don't know. That sure be cool. Um, but anyway, I just think that's, uh, that's wonderful. And to be working at the city level is municipal level is, um, yeah, it's the right place, I think, or it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a critical place um, between the, the global donut um, kind of thing and then individual businesses and organizations. Absolutely. And, and a great, great observation on the, um, on the community centers and spot on. So we were looking for quite a while for the right use case to use in that strategy lab. Um, and, and what that use case needed to do was it needed to provide the, the foundation for us to, to kind of show what the effect of what we're proposing can be. At the same time, it had to be manage, manageable in some way in that short time that we had available. But, but it, it also needed to be a use case that, as you say, is kind of, um, it could be very impactful also for, for changing and improving the community, right? And so um, it, precisely the points that you just mentioned were, uh, were, were very, very important in, in why we chose that as the use case for those workshops. And, uh, and I think what you're saying about municipalities, firstly, from, from an impact point of view, also spot on, that's, that's why they're so important and such a great place to start. And also um, very much for us, the, the difference between a fully profit-oriented company and a municipality that already has the best, uh, the best um, outcome for their citizens in their, their heart of their interest, right, makes a big difference because the openness to what we're proposing is much, much bigger, um, where whenever you talk to a, to a business, you have to sort of give them the light uh, the light version and, and still the kind of more egocentric, how does this serve you version, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well said, Tim. I, I also wonder if there's some amazing opportunities in there for experimentation in, you know, setting different kinds of goals and within, within certain organizations with the, with the goal of really having community-based impacts and, um, uh, and whether, the, you know, to what extent is that manifest at individual levels at some variant on collective levels, um, interpersonal stuff, and um, as well as the environment, because they all have to be there. But it, the complexity is a little bit mind boggling. Absolutely, yeah. Andrew? Hey, guys, great um, presentation. Um, two questions. Was this, were you just engaging with staff or were there any citizens involved? And number two, what's, um, is there gonna be another round of uh, consulting that you, you're hoping to engage with the city? Um, yeah, so we were focused on the corporate leadership team, which is, in, is made up of six individuals and then a couple of peripheral people like the head of strategy and sustainability who provoked the whole thing were part of the conversation. And because the nature of the conversation called for such vulnerability, 
um, after initially saying like, let's have sustainable Waterloo region in the room and let's have the academic center through which we're now developing a larger scale applied research program focused on municipalities in the room and, and, and let's have the other cities represented in the room, that being Cambridge, Waterloo in the region. Um, all of that kind of fell to the side because we realized if we wanted to have the most successful engagement of those six individuals, we needed them to be vulnerable and comfortable and that was sort of job one. Um, yeah, and so, uh, you know, going back to the visual that Tim provided in terms of the phased approach in the program, you know, our next step is to go from this initial experience, which is essentially a taster that gets them to sense, feel, make concrete what the potential is of participating with us and, and leveraging the enterprise evolution solution. So next, what we would do is, is actually design the transformation, which means that we would more specifically tailor the program to their needs, to their specific context, based on the planning cycles and where they are with their vision and their strategy, et cetera, um, such that we can execute it, at which point we would have a full-blown strategy developed and some peripheral stuff that would lead to a final phase, which we haven't really discussed or determined whether or not we'd be more or less involved in um, that would be based on transformation implementation. Um, but the point of enterprise evolution as a, as, a, as a model is that it's iterative anyway. You know, we're talking about a long-term transition that would involve transformational change in phases based on priorities and planning over time. Um, and part of what makes the program unique um, to, while we're at it is that we're trying to help them build the capabilities so that they can eventually do this ind independently. But we might still be involved for quite some time in helping them find the way and to build those capabilities more fully. And, and perhaps to add to that, I think the, the question whether citizens were engaged is a, is a great one. And uh, while it really wasn't possible because there were very sensitive matters uh, in, during those workshops, I think it's, it's safe to say that one of their, their main development priorities is improving um, citizen engagement for the city and making that more just and more equitable and, and finding new ways to do citizen engagement. And so that was one of their one of their absolute priorities. So where, whereas we weren't able to, to really have citizens in this workshop, I think uh, going forward for the city, it's a, it's a big focus. Um, I wanted to share something really briefly that might um, help to contextualize what we're trying to help them innovate because it's come up in both Doug and your points, Andrew. And I, I, I'm not sure, I don't think we'll have a chance to share this later. So I wanted to throw it up really quickly. Um, so the context here is a little different because this relates to another project, but if we look at what we're trying to do with cities, we're thinking about innovation at three levels. So one is at the, the individual community level where we're trying to um, essentially improve how interactions with, the, with residents are led such that more trust is developed, relationships are built, there's increased participation, more meaningful engagement and mutual exchange through learning on both sides. And in, at this level, we're looking at innovations that contribute to improved outreach, better use of language, as well as uh, better facilitation techniques. This is our sweet spot where I think the SSBMG plays most strongly at the organizational level where we're talking about improving management practices. So really taking a more systemic approach to planning performance management, and this might involve contributions to governance, strategy development, decision-making, reporting, and the development of new capabilities. And at the highest level, we, we look at the system's point of view, and this is about improving how municipalities collaborate with others. So at this level, we're talking about helping cities to design and orchestrate co-creative engagement with all relevant organizations, both within and beyond municipalities' reach and influence. And so innovations at this level might, might contribute to stuff like uh, determining the ideal system level of scope, as well as helping to facilitate effective cross-organizational planning. Anyway, for what it's worth, I, I hope that's uh, somewhat useful in sort of contextualizing the levels at which innovation is needed to make things systemically more effective. Um, Simon asked in the chat um, if we thought about which methods to use for citizen engagement. And, and I, I want to say before we answer that question that uh, I think this could also be a great point, Simon, for you to perhaps um, also elaborate a little bit on where that came from. And if you have, yeah. if, if, if you're engaged in citizen engagement or, or, or you're, you're thinking about specific methods, because perhaps to briefly answer that question, we did not uh, get to that point yet where we were speaking about um, specific methods. What I can say is that the challenge is to make it more equitable and that that there was a discrepancy in who they wanted to reach. And, and essentially, I'm exaggerating now. We, we have this program. We have 
uh, we have the possibility for people to engage, but who, who really engages? It's, it's, uh, it's white males um, between or 50 and above that earn 100 grand per year. That's, that's kind of the response we're getting, right? Um, so how can we engage um, citizens in a more equitable way? And I mean, that is, that is also a major part of, uh, of a research project that's going on with Veris right now. Um, that's essentially how do we achieve um, uh, social justice in climate action planning. And, and a lot of that is about, uh, for which, by the way, we're trying, and that might answer your question partly, um, for which we're trying to develop uh, an online, a digital engagement platform. Um, but in order to be able to do that right, um, first, we need to understand what are the needs of, of different groups of citizens and how they would like to engage and how they would like to voice their needs and their values, right? Because, uh, because if we want to make engagement equitable, then, then we need to understand everyone first and then need to tailor solutions really to, to their needs. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, just quickly, I'm really enjoying this talk because um, I've been involved in a number of projects um, in the past and also in the future. Um, Brazil's quite interesting because there are a number of municipalities which over the last couple of years have been devastated through some quite tragic industrial accidents. Um, I'm sure maybe you've seen some quite large um, ecosystems being destroyed. Out of that tragedy, a number of very major companies, it, it's really companies rather than government municipalities, but there are a number of companies now looking at what does this mean and how can they help regenerate both the ecosystems together with the municipalities uh, who have suffered a lot of loss. So we've, um, we've been asked to take a look at that um, in a number of creative ways. But also my wife, Maria, she was um, involved in implementing Balanced Scorecard in a number of municipalities. And one way of engaging citizens, um, they, I don't know if you're familiar with Future Search, but Maria actually ran a very major Future Search um, exercise with, I think it was around 800 uh, citizens or, you know, members of the local community. It's a fantastically engaging way to help people think about the future and work together, you know, with um, local government. Also, the only, I'll just finish now, the only other comment is that there are one or two really interesting Brazilian case studies um, where they've already done this, but there doesn't really seem to be any English language content about, you know, working with things like Bandit Scorecard and also strategy maps, strategic maps at a municipality level. And this is where I was talking about the fact that a lot of municipalities, they only really want to think about objectives and individual goals. They rarely think about how you actually, the systemic underlying factors that connect them. And this is where, you know, we've used a combination of our holonomics approach together with say the systemic issue, uh, systemic aspects of balanced scorecard to help Municipal leaders in municipalities develop a strategic narrative to help engage their communities because a strategy map when it's well developed has cause and effect relationships and this helps leaders develop a strategic narrative which better engages communities. But I, 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 it's really interesting, you know, your approach that you're taking, you know, especially with, you know, the transformation design um, methodology as well. On, on the note of uh, the balance scorecard, for what it's worth, um, we've recently connected with somebody who's a little more looped into the R3.0 community um, named Mark McElroy, who created the multi-capital scorecard, okay, um, which includes a, a, a comprehensive performance management methodology. Um, and uh, yeah, we found it to be quite useful in our conversations with Kitchener in terms of how to address those the systemic issues and bring context-based sustainability into the equation into the equation for them in a meaningful way, and it actually helped because the CAO is a former accountant and has that sort of orientation. Um, anyway, for what it's worth, um, I, I would highly recommend to anyone in this group checking out the the Multi Capital Scorecard website and some of the resources available. It, it hasn't really been talked about in this particular network very much, but it it seems like it it fills a, a pretty significant gap in terms of what's needed to transform from a management perspective.
And, and for what it's worth, um, a lot of the conversations that I've had from my, my job at the university recently with companies that are also looking into sustainability, um, um, BMW, for example, um, that, that are very serious about how they're trying to approach the topic. And one of the first issues that comes up is accounting and, and, and is exactly how, how can we measure better what we're doing. And so I think that the potential impact is, is enormous. Are there any other questions before we go back to presentation mode? I was just going to double check the chat. Um, these might be out of order, um, but Andrew just made a comment about uh, at the trade-offs of using COVID as an uh, trade-offs dot 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 using COVID as an example dot 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 economy versus public health. I think Simon was talking about this being an interesting talk. We've already covered that. Um, Andrew um, asked, uh, you addressed social justice. Was that in response to George F uh, Floyd or was it already embedded in your program? I'm not sure if that was answered yet. Um, so quickly on the social justice part, I mean, looking at it from a systemic perspective, naturally justice is a, a key aspect. It's represented in the donuts. So it's not necessarily like something that we focused on, but it was the topic that they're already deeply engaged in addressing and that they were happy to see was represented as part of the sort of systemic view that we introduced them to. Right. And Randy uh, posted out uh, the UNRISD um, uh, PDF that will go out in the link later on. Uh, how, 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 um, how big a part did data drive the strategy development? And Randy said not nearly enough. Is there any, any more comments on that? Um, I would just say, you know, there's there's not that there's not enough discipline to support the kinds of complex decisions that they have to make. So uh, I, I think a big part of the realization was that there is a need for more data and and also the need from a materiality perspective to focus on collecting data around what actually matters for the city based on its context within the world. And so that determination and that determination materiality is a starting point for data collection and strategy development is a necessity and something that the accounting CAO was really excited to hear would be uh, an entryway into the sort of journey that we'll, we'll begin with them. Right. Um, Josh says, co-creative catalyzers. Um, Simon, oh, we already talked about the citizen engagement. Um, uh, um, Douglas offered a useful, um, uh, article on inside out model museums planning for cultural impacts within the museum sector. Um, that will be included in the final. Sorry, my my thing is my <laughs> my cursor is going crazy. <laughs> sorry, Eric said with your focus on cities, will you be able to be looking to work with companies, and how will you be engaging with them? Randy, do you want to take that one based on the recent conversations you had? Or, I mean, I can also. Um, yeah, quickly, I would say um, the reason why our focus will probably be disproportionately placed on cities has much to do with a project that I'm now co-leading. Uh, Tim, would it be a good time to maybe talk about Varus really quickly? Yeah, just uh, be mindful that it's uh, seven to midnight or here. Like we, we have seven minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try and summarize it in two minutes or less. So the, the Flourishing Enterprise Institute is currently uh, incubated at Varus, which is at the, the at Wilfrid Laurier University and uh, the director of Varus launched a program, a project um, focused on bringing a social justice, social equity and accessibility lens to climate action planning, being that it's often done in a very narrow sort of way uh, and specifically focused on municipalities. And so uh, we started a conversation about that and I basically challenged him and suggested that the answer to addressing climate action planning issues doesn't lie in climate action planning, it lies in the center of the organization because climate action planning is arbitrary. There's no real valuation of what the importance of climate action is as part of all of the objectives of the city. And you can't address social equity and accessibility issues through a climate action planning process without transforming the relationships you have with citizens at large. So it calls for innovations at the center of the organization. And that's essentially what we've already got three quarters baked and ready to go. So let's collaborate. So it's led to uh, a, a grant being secured and a, a few months of establishing a partnership. And our goal is to go after a large grant in the new year, along with a few dozen partners who we've secured, which would result in us doing um, a three to seven year long applied learning uh, program where we would engage cities in applying 
many of the innovations across those three layers of innovation that I shared, you know, the systemic level, at the organizational level, and at the, the individual community level, um, based on their own context, and then being, being part of a peer group where they're learning to, together. And one of the things that makes the project unique is that um, from an academic perspective, we're working with multiple institutions and academics across disciplines. Uh, we have a large innovation community at the table ready with solutions. Uh, we have municipalities represented, of course, and perhaps most uniquely, we have equity seeking groups that are part of the entire process. So rather than getting perspective at the time when we need it, the idea is the entire program, the, the project, the partnership will be shaped based on the perspective of the equity seeking groups who will be involved from start to finish. And so um, from that perspective, um, I've had the opportunity now to talk to about a dozen, maybe more other cities and had the opportunity to share exactly what happened at Kitchener, the nature of our innovations, our perspective on how the opportunity isn't actually incrementally improving climate action planning, but transforming how the city functions and the fact that we can lead a conversation that in the way that they haven't been able to to this point may actually engage their senior leaders in seeing an opportunity for themselves rather than being pestered by their climate action planning professionals, et cetera, to do more or to be a little more ambitious. And so the reaction has been amazing. Like the, there isn't anyone who isn't super excited when I share the stories and who doesn't want to give us the chance to talk to their senior leadership or to try and orchestrate that. So it's just pointing to a lot of opportunity. And if we can now demonstrate what we're doing at Kitchener and with other cities um, in a really rigorous academic way, I mean, the, I think there's, there's a real potential for us to be busy with cities alone before we think about businesses, although we wouldn't preclude ourselves from working with businesses as well. You haven't been working with any of the stubborn cities in Alberta. I'd like to <laughs> see if we can make sure that that happens because Alberta is a, a, a challenged province in terms of uh, thinking liberally and socially about things. Um, Andrew, were you having a comment or were you just writing on your screen? No, I'm just waving. Eric, did you have something? Maybe one more quick question. Um, when you're talking about being rigorous academically, I'm just curious to hear some more about the and we're very tight on time, so I don't think there's a way to frame it right now. It's just, I don't know if the others in the group, but just as SSBMG, how can SSBMG members engage in that? How are you engaging with the academic community? I know there's been workshops since we've opened, opened people. There's SSBMG, there's FEI, there's Refocus. There's a lot of different pieces of this puzzle. I'm just wondering if others are confused, so how to plug in, where to plug in, and who's doing what where. Yeah, the, there isn't a, a simple way to explain it all, I guess. At the moment, um, my involvement in the project as co-lead is with my refocus hat on. So I'm hired as an individual to co-lead this, focus more on the partnerships and the development of the program versus the research side of it, which is what the director of Barris is focused on. Um, the FEI is represented as a, co as, a, as a core partner. So Peter Jones is part of a team of eight individuals Two, there's two of each, two representatives of each of the stakeholder groups. So the FEI is there um, sort of speaking on behalf of our innovation community. And then there's basically an open call, call for partners that we've uh, circulated through the FEI and, and other networks suggesting that if you happen to be part of the municipal sphere or an innovator or representing a social equity uh, seeking group, um, you know, feel free to join the project to participate in our workshops to learn more about how you can get involved and to consider becoming a partner if you feel like there's something meaningful you can contribute and gain by, by participating in the eventual longer term study. So for someone in the SSBMG to engage, you would recommend through the workshops or? I mean, reaching out to us directly is, is not a problem. I mean, I can talk about this. Peter can talk about it as an SSBMG and FEI representative, it, there isn't like a clear or, or fixed channel. It's pretty casual. So any interest in what we're doing is, is fine to surface with me or with Peter. Do you envision the enterprise evolution method becoming more open, like the R3.0 is partners in their blueprints kind of thing, or how can it collaboratively develop? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, at this point it was, our ambition was to do a market test and just figure out if there was an appetite for this sort of thing. And um, of course, at this point, three or even four organizations, if you consider Anthony and EJC, are the owners of, of, of the innovation that have, have developed it. And I think, you know, we still sit in the place where purpose is our primary interest and scaling what we're doing is, is something we're very deeply committed to. And so I think there's conversations to have as we determine that it's worth pursuing or if we eventually determine that this is worth pursuing further around 
how do we model this? How can we train others to scale it up if there is growing demand and so forth? So I, I don't have answers for you today. We're still at such an early stage and just trying to establish proof of concept with one organization really in, in the municipal sphere, but there's definitely conversations to be had. Yeah, I think it's a super exciting, interesting conversation. We're doing some some stuff in rural Alberta as well. So small municipalities might be um, eager and uh, uh, um, nimble enough to engage uh, in, in a fairly quickly way as opposed to say the city of Calgary. Um, so I'm gonna wrap up the meeting um, and thank you so much for everyone taking the time and coming. We know we ever had this kind of short notice the October 13th meeting will be posted this week. I think I was able to salvage um, the video. And uh, if anyone's listening to this video right now, because you couldn't attend the meeting, feel free to ask, ask questions of Tim and I as the animators, and we'll make sure that the your questions get answered um, from the speakers and the other people who are involved in the meeting. Um, any other final thoughts before we go? Something just got popped into the chat so douglas just po posted a little bit more on the outside uh, inside out model so we'll make sure that all the links are included in the video um thanks everybody for attending give me a smile so we can have a nice family shot uh, <laughs> yeah if, if anybody has any burning questions i'm, I'm happy to stay on for a, a couple of extra minutes and and um sure. and address whatever then I'll comes keep up, if that's okay with you laurie yeah sure yeah. Thanks so much for the opportunity uh, to present and to share a bit of an update with the group and really appreciate everyone's attention and time. Uh, Tim, do you want to add anything? No, I just also want to say thanks. This was, uh, this was great fun. I'm happy after two months of uh, abstinence to see, to see everyone again and have, uh, have conversations. It was great. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much. It was great. Thanks, Randy. Thanks, Tim. It was great. Thank you both. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Thanks